So if you know someone who uh, was not able to attend, thank you, or you want to watch it again, uh, you'll be able to do that. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for attending the meeting today. My name is Brenda Bowen. Maybe we'll wait for the train to go by. <laughs> I can't compete with that. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As I mentioned, my name is Brenda Bowen. I'm one of the information officers with the Rocky Mountain Complex Incident Management Team 1. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, the focus of our meeting today is not really about what we've been doing since the team has been here. We want to spend some time and talk about the things that we know you have questions about. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that initial response and, and the effort that took place, and then obviously what comes now, right? What are those next steps? Um, I do have Phil Daniels, one of our incident commanders here. I have uh, Chris Schroeder here with Nebraska Emergency Management. If you're interested in knowing anything about the work that we've been doing while we're here, we're more than happy to answer those questions. That's just not going to be the focus of the presentations. Um, we do have an agenda on the screen. We will start with some quick opening comments from Phil. We're then going to move into a weather timeline of the bogey fire with uh, Darren Claybo, our incident meteorologist. Ted Tion is then going to spend some time talking about that initial suppression operation, what happened um, after the fire first started in those first hours. Stina Seaman with emergency management is then going to talk about the emergency management operational side of that. Stu Shepard is then going to uh, provide an update on the 4-H camp. And we'll have closing comments and kind of the forest next steps uh, with District Ranger Julie Bain. So this is kind of our plan. Uh, please hold all questions until the end. Let's get through the presentations. Once we've completed that, we will do a question and answer time. Um, we want to get through as many questions as we can, so we'll probably try to move through that pretty quickly. Uh, we do know that there are people who sometimes don't like to stand up and ask a question in front of the crowd. So you'll see that we have maps around the room. Once we get done with that formal Q&A, if you will, we will then break and we'll stay here as long as you need and we'll stand at a map and answer those questions. So all of us will be here until you get the questions answered that you need. Sound good? All right. So let's go ahead and get started uh, with Phil and opening comments. So Phil, I'm just going to have you pass it to the next speaker in line. All right. Thank, thank you. you. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Phil Daniels. Um, I'm uh, the uh, incident commander for Rocky Mountain Area uh, Complex Incident <laughs> Management Team 1. Like I said, it's, a, it's quite a mouthful, but our... Uh, our job is to come into uh, an area that uh, is suffering a, 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 an incident, a fire, a flood, a, a disaster of some kind, and try to bring a, a certain amount of order um, to, uh, to what's going on and, and I th try to help the communities get back to a certain amount of, of, of normalcy, okay? And so, you know, we've been honored to come in here. It's, a, it's um, very unfortunate that, that the fire occurred. And, uh, but the work that we did uh, was only successful because of the work that was done, you know, prior to us getting here. And uh, whether it was the uh, Halsey Fire Department, um, Bub uh, Rodocker, the chief there, or uh, Spencer Burke from Thedford. Did you make it here, Spencer? Did you make it? Excellent. Uh, solid work from those guys. Um, Dunning Fire Department, Kevin Anderson and the chief. Um, don't know if he made it or not. Um, also, you know, the Thomas County Sheriff, Joseph, Joseph Smith, uh, um, and then it's always a challenge to talk about the ultimate sacrifice. That was made by uh, Assistant Chief Moody from Perdum. And served the department for 40 years. And it's very emotional to me, <laughs> having been a, been a chief, um, I just like a moment of silence 
for a chief movie. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, the Moody family, as well as uh, Chief Masick. Are you here, sir? If you're okay, um, remember them uh, in in your prayers and everyone who participated in this event. Um, Thank you for the hard work that you did. And because of that, ultimately successful, this community will come back. Um, keep the Moody's in your prayers. And uh, thank you again for being able to uh, host us here. And uh, at that point, I'll you know pass it on to Daryl. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Phil. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Darren Claybo. I'm the uh, incident meteorologist here. Uh, my day job, I'm a professor of meteorology and atmospheric science at South Dakota School of Mines and Technology up in Rapid City. Uh, I know the area well. I work a lot with Nebraska, just like I do with North Dakota and our surrounding states. Um, it's my second fire in, in Nebraska that I've been on as incident meteorologist. The first was back in 2012. Uh, familiar with this type of area, familiar with the climate, familiar with the geography. Uh, and I just want to share a couple of things that I've learned uh, being on this incident, and especially I'm hoping that you guys can take some of these ideas as we progress forward through the rest of the fall. Hopefully, um, we can identify some times that fire danger might be enhanced, that you might run into other issues or other times that are similar to this one. So coming into last Sunday, um, the area has seen roughly 60 to 70 percent of its annual average precipitation. You're in D2 severe drought on the... Um, the United States Drought <laughs> Monitor. This summer, precipitation's even been less, 50 to 60% over the past three months. So obviously everything's been very, very dry. That has led to very dry fuels across the landscape as well. One of the metrics we use is called Energy Release Component, or ERC. Basically, it's just a metric of how dry the fuels are. It takes into account live fuel moisture, which is like green grass, that type of thing, and dead fuel moisture. If there's any dead uh, vegetation on the landscape, it takes that into account as well. And I got a four-year-old at home that I'm missing a lot right now. <laughs> um, it takes into account that as well. And when we start to see those ERC values skyrocketing, that's when we know that the fuels conditions are very susceptible to any ignitions and are going to be conducive to fire spread. We saw our ERC values in the 90th to 97th percentile, uh, which means they're in the 3 to 10 percent driest that we've ever seen. Um, so very, very dry fuels on the landscape. Then you take a day like last Sunday, Strong southerly winds gust from 25 to 30 miles per hour. Temperatures in the mid to upper 80s, which is borderline record high temperatures for this time of the year. Uh, combined with relative humidity, which is a measure of moisture in the atmosphere, below 25%. Those things are the triggers. You put those triggers on top of the overlying climate that we've seen, the dryness that we've seen, and all of the conditions are starting to come together. The pieces of the puzzle are coming together for large wildfire growth. And unfortunately, we did see that ignition source on the landscape, uh, which, which started the fire. The fire started, uh, from what I understand, around the noon hour. Um, I know it was burning by 1 p.m. because it actually burned over the weather station that we use uh, that is out there, that is no longer available to us. And then, of course, those strong winds persisted late into the evening, and moderate winds persisted overnight, allowing that fire to, to grow, obviously, to the, to the north and to the northwest, as you <coughs> see the outline of the footprint here. Just for the map, Halsey's down here. Uh, forest down here, point of origin, somewhere down on the south side, and then of course the fire grew off to the northwest, um, you know, jumped to Highway 2 and then, and then squirted off into the sand hills off to the north. Fortunately, we had a front stall out over the area on Monday that brought a lot of those scattered showers uh, to the area. Anywhere from a tenth to maybe fifteen hundredths of an inch of precip was received over the fire. That's not enough to put the fire out itself, but it was a nice uh, enough to slow it down, especially because when you have ponderosa pine with the grass understory like you do down here, combined with the grass that you have up here, it's just enough to add a little bit of moisture to the fuels and allow our folks to get in there and actually suppress the fire. Uh, so Monday we saw those favorable conditions. Tuesday was a continuation of those favorable conditions. Cooler temperatures, less wind, higher humidity. 
Wednesday was a little bit warmer of a day. We saw a few things start to poke up, a little bit of smoke out there, so we knew this fire was still active, it was still there. Um, and so we took some actions, and I'll, I, I won't get too far into that, but it took some actions to suppress the areas that did still hold some heat. Obviously today, had a cold front move through this morning, much higher relative humidities, a little bit of a breeze out there, uh, but those are good things. Tomorrow, gonna be much cooler. I'm actually a little bit concerned for our firefighters that are out sleeping in tents at the fairgrounds out there because overnight tonight, we're gonna have temperatures down in the low 30s. Friday night uh, into Saturday morning, even a little bit cooler with maybe even some rain. So definitely thinking about our firefighters that are sleeping on the ground, trying to ensure that they don't get hypothermic or have safety issues. <coughs> going forward this weekend, we're gonna start to dry out once again. Again, we didn't get a lot of rain on this fire. It was most definitely not a season ending event. Um, it was a season checking event. And as we all know, especially if we get frost on Saturday morning, it's gonna kill off the rest of the vegetation. That cured vegetation then is gonna be receptive to fire as we go through the rest of the fall. Monday, Tuesday, I do have some lingering concerns about the potential for enhanced fire weather conditions. What that means, again, just warmer weather, drier, lower RHs, and stronger winds on Monday and Tuesday. Fortunately, it looks like another cold front is gonna come through on Wednesday, and hopefully we'll start a seasonal pattern that will start to cool off. But you guys, just like what I see up in South Dakota, um, fall's our windy season. Especially when we come into our windy season with the dry fuels on the landscape, I do have concerns for fire going into the fall. So I just encourage you all to understand that um, we're not out of the woods yet. Frankly, we're not gonna be out of the woods until we see snow cover and a lingering snow cover. Uh, if you have any further questions for me, I'll be hanging out afterwards, but I'll, I'll pass it on um, to our next speaker, Ted. Okay, so the timelines are gonna be a little different because we're on mountain time and central time. Our dispatch center is out of mountain time. Our raw station runs on mountain time. So the page, when I got the page was at <coughs> 135 or 1335. <coughs> at that time I went, well, I left my house, started making the phone calls to all of my folks. I think I received a call from Thetford, Halsey and Dunning at that time and just said go. They wanted to know where it was, what it was. I had the same information that they had at that time. It's like, I don't know, I can't. Once I get there, I'll, I'll go to the lookout tower and find out what's up, where it's at. <coughs> um, I think the page said it's down by the campground and something. N nobody really knew what was where it was at at the moment. So once we got there, um, I got Chance, Giles, and uh, Cole Seeley. <laughs> In our fire truck, they took off, and then uh, um, Tim Lee and Dane Peterson got in a UTV and headed that way. Um, Jason was in a UTV. We were waiting for Ben and Sarah Mol Ben Pickering and Sarah Mullins to uh, still arrive. They were coming from their houses. Um, so once they, <coughs> so once we got kind of a game plan there, I ran up to the lookout tower. Um, actually, the weather service called me, asked for, you know, if I wanted a um, spot forecast, and I said yes. Um, after I caught my breath, and I even told them, hold on, I gotta catch my breath, I just ran to the top of the tower. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, we got that going. Um, I called Tim, actually on the radio, and said, hey, give me a size up of what you see on the ground and tell me exactly where it is when you see it. Um, he called dispatch, I think at that time, he named the fire and uh, let me know that he <coughs> was looking for the individuals um, that had started the fire because they were still out on the trail. And at, uh, I got a few timelines, I can't give you them all, but at 1418, <coughs> that's when the fire, when I was really, watching the fire, it was up in the crowns, it was a running crown fire, it never came down out of the crowns. Um, it was starting to come up to, as the locals, everybody knows it was planted with um, fuel breaks in it. Um, it was probably, uh, I don't know, 400 yards away from the first fuel break and it jumped way over that fuel break, so we knew that wasn't gonna stop it. At that time I got on the radio, <coughs> I think Halsey might have already been out there, called and, uh, three different channels, told everybody to leave the fire and get back to the district. We're just gonna to go to point protection and start protecting buildings. And at that time, I told all the um, local VFDs 
to <clears throat> go back and protect their districts. Um, I believed at that time it looked like it was moving straight north. Thought it was probably go, go into Halsey. Um, I think Joseph called me on the phone asking me what was going on. They were in the middle of a, uh, a, a funeral service when this all started as well for a, um, a firefighter that passed away uh, a month ago or a few weeks ago. And they were attending that. <clears throat> Let him know about that. I think they better evacuate Halsey and get all fire trucks along the road and be ready to protect their, their jurisdictions. Um, at that time, then I ran back down the tower, um, got down there, tied in with Jason. They hadn't made it out yet. They were starting to put sprinklers on top of the, um, the houses in the compound at the shop in the bunkhouse and then getting stuff basically uh, most of all the flammable stuff out and into the field nursery. They're getting all the sprinklers turned on uh, in all the nursery beds. So that was happening. And then at that time, I was checking to see if Chance made it back. Chance made it back. They pulled in, started to protect. So at um, 15, 18, that's when it hit <coughs> the top of the hill and started. And I believe that's probably what blew the spot <laughs> over the highway. I don't know if I'm supposed to be pointing at this. <clears throat> so when it came over here and hit the top of the hill, that's when it really was throwing stuff, and that's what we believe started that, um, this part of the fire. Um, I don't think any of, um, I think Carl is who I was speaking with, with Halsey at the time. Um, most of us couldn't see that fire at first because of all the smoke that was blowing over the top. Um, when it was coming over the top of everything. Um, Carl called um, at about that point because we were running down to check um, to see if it had spotted into Barnes's or anywhere on the other side of the river. Um, and then I got st <coughs> stuck. Uh, myself, Jason, and Ben um, basically couldn't move out of the the field beds over by the chemical shed. Uh, it just, the fire is coming over the top and we just can't see past, I don't know, four or five inches. So we just had to sit there. Carl called and asked if he could order a couple um, different resources. Said, yes, absolutely. It's yours, your, it's your dish. Um, there was some communication deal. So I w went ahead and ordered um, Arnold and I don't remember, Brewster maybe. I don't, I don't know who it was and let them know, no matter, I don't care who it is, if Halsey asks for resources, please get them, let them have that authorization to order as many resources as possible, including Thetford if it gets up there. <coughs> and uh, and it's, I, I think from there on out, you could probably ask Bub or Spence if I believe everything works smoothly after that. Um, so once, once we got it, once it, Jumped over. Um, well, I was still looking for Tim. Tim actually gave me a call, let me know that he was stuck right at the um, 86B and the 4-H Camp Road, that where you turn off 86B and go down the road to the 4-H Camp. They couldn't cross because, of course, the, I mean, it was just um, all up in the trees the whole time, so they couldn't come down. So they kept bumping down the road with, um, I think he had five people with him. He did find them. <coughs> and as they bumped, I tried to go get them a couple different times, but there's just no way to go through that um, fire front at all. So just told them to keep bumping until we could keep them safe. And they ended up going clear to Natick Campground um, and parked there. At that point, I think I ran out and went down the highway to see what I could <coughs> see to the west and see where it was coming and what parts it was hitting. Um, uh, it, it jumped, and I know Carl said that they were all heading over to the north to fight on that fire. He said, fantastic, we won't worry about you. Just let me know if you need anything, and I'll do the same, vice versa. And then um, as I was going down the highway, we ended up, um, Jace, one of our seasonal firefighters, he was coming back home, picked him up, threw him in my vehicle, and, and eventually tied him back in with uh, Jason or Nate, one of, somebody, I, 
one of those guys. Can't remember that whole detail for you. Uh, and then at, of course, 1630, um, that's when the, um, we got the page that there needed to be an ambulance. Um, we ch <coughs> I, I called Joseph to ask what was going on um, to see how many ambulances or what was going on and if we'd still have service for other folks. At, the, at that time, it didn't sound like it was that critical. Of course, we didn't know we were all um, super um, concentrated, I guess, on the fire <coughs> and trying to keep uh, all everybody safe at that moment as it was coming over the top of the hill. Um, I think at some point I called Julie to make sure she knew that she needed to get out of her house. And I called Rich Gilbert. He was coming back from Lincoln. Let him know that he needed to get out of his house as well. And of course, Rich and Mike were both not home. <coughs> so I let him know that just, <laughs> I just kind of told him, I didn't tell him what was really going on. I didn't want him to wreck driving home. <coughs> so I just let him know when they did show up to make sure to give me a call so I knew where they were prior to coming into the forest. And if there was, um, I needed to know that information first before they came in. Uh, so then at some point in this time frame, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of, it all kind of runs together a little bit. Uh, once the fire got into a little bit of grass, I drove out, picked up all the, the five kids and Dane and Tim, brought them back through a lower fire and got them back in, in Tim and um, Dane engaged back into the operations where they went over to the ranger's house, the nursery manager's house, and um, the assistant engine captain's house, I guess, is what it is right now, to so start protecting that area. Mike started to take over, or he kind of ran that show. Um, they were going to start back burning a little bit of that so it wasn't such an intense heat coming down onto the houses. That did not work. <coughs> it, um, as soon as they uh, Chance went up and put um, one strip and he dotted it instead of a just dragging fire the whole way, dip, um, drop one or two every 20 feet. And all it did was make every tree torch. So they stopped that operation. Um, we just got a CAPS unit, so we sprayed down the houses um, with foam. I think that probably helped pretty good on that area. It stayed on the houses for a good hour. And we kept bringing that around, or those guys kept bringing it during that time. Um, and then when I brought the five kids back, I happened to see Tim Sirks, the Blaine County Sheriff, sitting in the nursery over by the packing shed. So I swung in there, let him know that I needed to have him come over to their vehicles so they could get a statement. Um, at that time, Tim called the state patrolman in state patrolman, met him down at the main parking lot in the office at that moment, and they got, um, they, I don't know, interviewed him, I guess is what you'd say, and got the statements for everything. <clears throat> so that went swell, and then we got everybody, those folks, on, evacuated on out of the forest. Uh, Went back down because I caught word that possibly the chemical shed had caught on fire. Um, if it did not at all, never, I don't even know if it even got any black even around it. Um, Jason and um, another group, Ounce Ammo, I think was down there making sure that was secure. Um, if, I don't know if everybody knows about the, some of the chemicals that are out at the nursery, but that they're bad. So, <laughs> yeah. So, if I laugh, don't take offense to it. That's just kind of how my stress works. <clears throat> Instead of cry, I just giggle. So, um, so they were around that. That was great. Um, but, so anyways, in the chemical, uh, chemical shed, um, for future references, if, if, if it is coming in, and that is like super high priority. If it does catch on fire, everybody needs evacuated. There's over 2,200 pounds of meth methyl bromide and something else. Um, methyl bromide and Sherry, if Sherry, I thought, I've seen Wayne, 
in the methyl bromide, they have tear gas in the methyl bromide just to keep you out of the bad stuff. So <coughs> just future reference, um, if you guys hear that, we need to get evacuated. If you don't get a call from somebody, just move. <coughs> so at that time, where am I at? Once we kind of got that secured, um, the fire finally passed the road that once you turn off 86B and you turn to go to the 4-H camp, it finally passed the, road, the entrance to actually go into the fire camp or into the 4-H camp. I drove down into there first before I went to go find Tim. Drove down in there, um, the maintenance building or whatever that building is right when you come in was fully engulfed in fire. Um, the obstacle course was in fire. And as I kept coming around, I was just like, well, this isn't going to get any better. Um, happened to see the staff house. It's completely fine. So that was, I started having a lot of hope. <clears throat> Off to my right, um, all I could see was robes on the ground. I pulled up to the um, lodge, and it was, it was there. And uh, at that time, it had two um, flames on the walkway. So I called Chance because he had an actual fire truck. And he grabbed down Samuel. They started to head up. And Jason came up as well in a UTV. Um, they seen the exact same thing I did. They started putting it out, got both, both the deals out. And then, of course, um, um, if you all seen the lodge, it's really big. Uh, the, so you couldn't see on the back side. Those trees torched up. Um, I know Cole and Jason went to the back and were hitting the trees and the back of the wall. It was fully engulfed. They <coughs> were starting to get a little progress, and another tree went up. And at that time, I believe it got in the eaves or into the walls, and the smoke started coming out the front window. Somebody was still in the front said, hey, hey. And then next thing, the and I may be kind of off a little bit on this, but uh, the back windows blew out of the building and the smoke started rolling out the front. And so at that time, we, it was pretty much, they, they didn't have any choice other than to leave. So if, if you do see those guys, um, I know that it's kind of hard because there was, we all thought there was a chance. So I got those guys. And then, of course, I guess um, Chance called. They, they were, uh, I guess they had a conversation before they told me that it burnt down. And then, of course, I asked all sorts of questions. And Chance had to tell me three times that it burnt down. So um, I did hear there was rumors that we, didn't, that we just let it burn down. That is not the case. We, we tried very hard. Um, so, anyways, we went on, went back down, started covering, making sure that the rest of the buildings of the nursery and the sheds um, stayed intact. And we saved, <laughs> we put out the roof three times or four times on that four car garage down by the two houses between the old office and the lifeguard house, if everybody remembers those. And then, of course, then we had to go around the next set of houses as it just kept rolling the whole time. Um, at this time, I started getting resources from um, more federal resources coming in. Um, uh, Caleb Meyer, he was our operations on the 201 fire. He was, he's our district FMO in Shadron. Um, he agreed that he could do operations again to let some of that stuff off of me. So at first, he went around. Started to scout everything out. Got down and we figured we got a pretty good, he had a pretty good idea of what we could do on the east side. Um, once it got out on the grass, we were going to treat it just like the 201 fire and just bring it out to the grass and shut it off. Um, so you would think at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, the fire behavior would quit. And it, it never, it just wouldn't. I think somebody in your guys' group asked me what the fire behavior was in the in briefing, and it literally was, it got in their crowns, 
stay in the crowns until 6.30 in the morning. So as we come around the group campground, um, they put sprinklers up on top of that as quick as they could um, and kept bringing the fire around where they could. They helped it when they could and when they couldn't. <clears throat> it got uh, over, once we finally got past the group, the actual structure of the group campground, we, um, it did, I think there were some piles in there that caught on fire, which was fine. We kept bringing it around, brought it black, and then at like five o'clock in the morning, it started to sprinkle, which was like gasoline for some reason, and it started to even torch even hotter. It spotted over, um, if anybody knows where the lagoons are, it spotted over both lagoons and got no cedar break along the river. We got three trucks, I believe, down into there to start working on that situation. And then uh, um, once that was kind of done, we kind of held up again. Uh, we did have a dozer that I believe was from South Dakota that started pushing line from the group campground out and around the corner and out into the um, Hall's pasture, I believe, and then into the Bovey and across so we could burn off that dozer line. Um, somewhere in that time frame, um, I talked with Bob and at the fire, sh in the fire hall. I, I think I kind of let him know. If Bob's here, you can correct me. I, th I think that's where we kind of knew what was a little bit of a plan. Things were starting to look a little bit better on their chunk, I think. So we had some of their resources come over to help with the burn going to the south. Um, at that time, I, I thought Mike was going to be our kind of our lighter, but he got kind of stuck on the timber that kept burning on that corner of the group campground. Um, I believe Troy Saner said, hey, I think we can start lighting this, because I had him come down because it looked like the fire was just starting to roll and we needed to protect um, Josh Hall's um, corner and um, Tim Lee, where he lives, and I um, can't think who's in the trailer house. Joe and Gary's structures through there. So they came in, they went in, and I said, if it gets to the dozer line, that's where we want to hold it. If it's jumped to the dozer line, try to put it out. Um, it hadn't got to the dozer line yet. I think I met Bub back at, out at the highway there, because I was sitting there so folks know which road to drive down into. Um, <laughs> I did forget, I did shut the trains down at some point in that time frame, so it was super handy uh, for the whole night because we were in and out the whole night. And uh, we're sitting there so the folks could see, ran into Bub. Um, we kind of talked about a few things. That's when Troy said, hey, I think we can burn this out. I might, <laughs> I might have been a smart something. Uh, <clears throat> at some point there, which made me nervous, and I then I had Mike go over and check, and then I went up and looked, and um, we, we looked at it. I believe it was some fire trucks out of Grant that had drip torches and started the burning operations headed to the south, and Troy was kind of the contact on that side. It was doing pretty good until 6.45, 7 o'clock, probably, and that's finally when it wasn't burning quite as good, but we still were getting decent black. They took it clear to Windmill 29 that night, and we had a morning briefing for all the other incoming resources that we had, but we put them up in the hotel that night, so they weren't running on zero sleep like the rest of us, and had them show up at 0700 at the main office for, the, for another morning briefing. Um, Brian Don, our forest FMO, was down. We kind of discussed things. I went ahead and turned the fire over to Brian, um, told him how we kind of ran the fire last night. We let um, Bub Rodocker and Spencer Burke run everything to the north and all the private ground. and Well, everything north of the highway was for them and everything south, private and forest service, we would um, watch. And... Uh, and, and Brian was really good and um, helpful with making sure that worked. And I believe um, Bob and Spence, I think it worked well doing it that way. Um, 
uh, I didn't mention, forget, I ordered the team um, right after I seen that jump uh, fire break when I was in the lookout there. I think I missed that s section of the um, deal. And the reason I ordered the team is was because I knew we were, I, to be honest, I really thought we'd lose everything in the compound. And I definitely don't even know where to start with any of that type of paperwork to fill out. Um, and I, th that really <laughs> is what it boils down to. I, I wouldn't even know how to help with that stuff. So, and and like he said, they're they're real. That's what they're for. They come in and they they take care of everything for all of that chunks of stuff. Um, so Brian ran it through the next next day. Um, we had the in briefing, I believe, at four o'clock, which is super awesome for any team to be in there within less than 24 hours. So I do appreciate for you guys showing up and going so fast and willing to accept it. Um, a lot of times um, when things are super hectic, teams don't necessarily, they usually get a shadow day so they can kind of learn and see what's going on. Um, it, but that was really awesome that they just were willing to take it and accept that responsibility uh, and let basically everybody else go home and go to bed for a little bit. Um, I don't know if I do questions now or we can do it later, but okay. I think that's about it. Whoever's next. <laughs> My name is Stina Seaman. I am with Region 26. I am the Deputy Emergency Manager. Um, the reason you get the deputy is Alma Beeland who's our emergency manager, took her first vacation in about 40 years this week. Um, she hired me one month ago. Um, so unfortunately, this is the only fire I'll ever get to use that excuse on. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about emergency management, kind of what our piece is and what we do. Um, of course, we're the dispatch center. So the 911 calls come into us. So of course, that's that first 911 call and all the 911 calls that came in after that. Um, I will say that I listened to the 911 call, um, a few of the 911 calls that came in for this, and I think that they were good calls. Um, our dispatchers asked good questions. They mapped on our systems well. Uh, we have a system called Geocom, and we have one called Rapid SOS. We looked at where it mapped. It matched up with where the fire initiated. So I think it went well um, that way. We tried to give um, good directions. It is a little hard out in that area to give the best directions. We have large maps. We pulled those out, we used those. The second call, we were able to get windmill numbers, those kind of things from the caller. So we used those. Um, <coughs> we followed our protocol, which we got from Ted. We use that, where we call Northern Great Plains the second piece is we call and page local VFDs, which is Halsey Purdom, Thedford, and then Dunning, which is what we did. And then the next call is back to Ted, which I think he had already been called by Great Plains. So we followed that protocol exactly how we were supposed to do. And then we go from there, which is following uh, what our incident commanders from there are, are asked to do. Um, Throughout the evening, we have mutual aids coming in. Um, over the evening, we had over 45 different volunteer fire departments respond. Um, I could read them all to you, but that could take some time. Um, everywhere from Atkinson O'Neill, Imperial McCook, Ogallala Grant, Valentine, I'm not gonna read them all, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you guys are welcome to come and look at this list. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers people giving and sacrificing their time. There's nothing I can do to tell you how much these people give and sacrifice to save your land, to save your livelihood. Um, I can't thank them enough. My husband's a volunteer firefighter, has been for 40 years. You guys know what they do, you know what they give. So tell them thank you every day. Um, there's, um, we had, these people had to work on their own that night. They had to try and save their own. 
with Mike. It was a hard night. It's going to be a hard day tomorrow for them. Um, hopefully, hopefully we can get through it. We will. We will get through it as a community. Um, that's what we do up here. But um, so, but just so you know, they sacrifice a lot. They sacrifice their times. Their family sacrifices a lot. So just remember that when when we're out there. Um, so kind of enough of that. Um, but just so you understand how the mutual aids work, <clears throat> we can only request them at the, we as, 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 as Region 26 don't make those decisions. Uh, we have to wait until the incident commander calls us and requests that. But we have to also do it kind of strategically. I can't request every community right away because if we start asking all of those communities and then we have an incident, so I take all the communities I've taken clear over to Ord, and then we have a fire somewhere between here and Ord, and I have nothing left. Then we have further issues, and we have to start pulling from here to go there. So we start trying to kind of stagger. So that's why we start pulling even further out. Well, then we start having delayed times to get here, just to help you understand why we're pulling so far away. So why do we pull from Imperial? Um, we do have mutual aid agreements. Um, we used, and I'm trying to not forget the names of Mid Plains and Southwest Mutual Aid. So they have large groups that come in to do that for us, and they're kind of set up to do that. We have a mutual aid up here that comes and helps to go in large groups, and so we'll send those those people down. Um, but that's part of what we did. We saved. By getting so many people here, I do think we truly saved land, we saved livestock. Um, you can speak to that more probably after the, after the meeting, Spencer, if, if you have questions. Um, I think that our incident commanders made amazing decisions. Um, they did really good at um, directing the people where they went. I said that night I hadn't really watched a fire firsthand at, at this level, and I said it kind of looked like watching a soccer game, a small child soccer game, because you'd see these fire trucks go to this side and then to this side, you know, like children following a soccer ball. Um, and so it was very confusing for me, um, but it clearly worked out well. Um, and so they did an amazing job at what they did, and it ended much sooner than I think we thought it was going to. We initially had talked that it would possibly last a couple of days. Um, and then we started hearing about four o'clock in the morning the words mop up, which in fire language is, is a very good phrase. Um, when I first started hearing that word or phrase, I was thrilled. Um, so something else that we work on or work with is critical incident stress management debriefings. Um, and just so you know, that's where we help our staff who've been through a very stressful situation. We bring in some mental health um, resources and we are gonna be doing that. Um, we have some of that set up for some of the departments already. This was a very stressful situation. Um, not only the loss of, of one of our brothers, but just the event itself. Um, so we are offering that. We will be working with that. We already have that set up for some of our departments. Um, I think, I think that's about it. So I'll be around afterwards if anybody has questions about what Region 26 does, who we are, or how we participated in this. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stuart Shepard and I'm the director of the Nebraska 4-H Foundation, and the 4-H Foundation owns um, the property, or owns the buildings that are on the, at the 4-H site. So um, this has been tough for us. You know, we, 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 our staff came yesterday, six of us, that, that this is a part of our jobs. I, I live in North Platte. This has been our camp as 4-H parents for 30 years. Um, it's been my job for the last 15 years, so um, it's pretty tough. But the, one of the things 
I, I want to say thanks to Ted and to Julie and to the staff of the Forest Service because we've been partners in this for 60 years and they've taken great care of our kids and any time that something like this has happened have called so that we could get the kids out of there and we did have young people in camp on Sunday they were college students from UNL as you know many of you know we have a, a wedding that was to be this weekend so that wedding's been moved to Grand Island and the people of Grand Island have been incredible at helping us get the food and things organized so that the young couple can have a, a celebration event so um, we we they were evacuated they went back to campus in Lincoln um, so yesterday we walked through the camp processed that um, today we had was media day and we had people in there um, to come and do their stories. So, you know, the, the next steps yesterday, the insurance company was with us. They'll be back again tomorrow. And then, um, yeah, the process of cleaning up begins and that will take months and months. So, you know, I know the question is, will you rebuild or what tomorrow will look like? And we've not had time to have those conversations with each other but I think we're all hopeful as all of you are that that there will be a I know that's gonna happen one of the things today you know I'm always the forever optimist and when we were up there today there's grass coming up through the the ashes there's new pine cones on the ground and those are all signs of hope that that there will be a good tomorrow. So um, in the first week of November, we'll have a celebration event here for all of you so that the people from the university can come and say thank you because you've been the ones that kept the camp going. I know a lot of people think it's all about 4-H, but 4-H was a small part of who occupied the camp in the summer months. It was you that held your family events here, your family reunions, your graduations, your proms. If you, if you look, we've not had hardly any bills of repairs for the camp because you came and took care of it. So we thank you from the bottom of our hearts and in the time in November, we'll have time to get together and celebrate all the good memories that we've had together and, and then we'll figure out where we go tomorrow. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Can is this working? Can you hear me? Hello, I'm Julie Bain. I'm the district ranger. Um, this will this is my eighth fire season here on the unit. Um, that's the first time I heard the whole story from Ted, and um, I, you know, so this summer. We've had, this is our second fire. The first fire we had was 4,192 acres. And um, I was in the fire tower a lot with Ted that night. And all the things he has going on, you would not believe how competent this person is and all the things he can get done. It is truly amazing. Two phones, radios, people coming up into the tower it's incredible the things that, that he thinks about and goes through and, and keeps people safe and directing traffic. It, it's like, I, I have so much respect for you, Ted. It's amazing. It's like, so this time is no different. Um, so the other thing I, I wanted to say too, another thing I learned this morning as part of the investigation, so you may or may not have seen the press release about the start. Um, it's pretty generic. And I want everyone to know that um, it is under investigation. And I'm not supposed to say this. I'll probably get in trouble if my boss is watching this. But there, there appears to be no negligence. Totally an accident. And the five people, or the people that Ted talked about, Tim bringing out could have very well lost their lives had it not been for Tim. So when Tim told me, oh, I got some people out, he didn't tell me that he also had to 
sit and hunker down and wait for the fire to burn around him with extra people in his rig getting out. So these people are incredibly hardworking and humble. So like I had to hear that from the law enforcement officer, not from them bragging about it. So I, I just cannot speak to the quality of the crew that you have on this forest. They, I can't say enough good about them. They're just wonderful people. So um, I'd like to just start off with some of the statistics on the fire in case people hadn't seen it. And this is what I was given on this morning at 1020. Sometimes acreages aren't exact or they change based on mapping, but the total acreage was 18,930. Forest service portion of that was 5,130. Private, 13,217. And state, 583. So for us, um, before this summer, we probably had maybe 18,000 acres of forest left from the original 30,000 that was planted. In 1965, there was another big fire, the Plum Fire, which also burned the Lookout Tower and the 4-H camp. Ted told me that I hadn't known that either, that it, but it, it just came from a different direction. So we've got two fires this summer that totaled 9,000, 310 acres of forest. So in this summer alone, we lost probably about half of the 18,000 acres of forest we had left. Um, in some sense, that's just a forest acting like a forest. So you heard from Darren that it's dry conditions. It's happening all over the West. I think we're just not used to it here. Um, I come from a big fire forest, and, and before these two fires, the largest fire we had was 600 acres started by some hunters. So this is a big deal for us this summer to have these big fires. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'll, I'll just go through my notes. Um, in terms of what's going on with the, the team, what I'm supposed to talk about is kind of what's happening next is that this team is leaving Saturday morning. They're purposely staying all day tomorrow so that um, anyone who wants to go to the funeral can go to the funeral and they'll be here to cover in case there's some random a start. They are going to leave us with about 43 people, which includes four engines and some other equipment. And so what that means is that Ted and his crew will have extra help that's still going through mopping, cleaning up, making sure the perimeter is secure. As you heard Darren say, if we don't get all of the smokes out and it warms up again in the trees, it'll spot up and it can start again. And, and this perimeter is still in the forest, right? Like the 201 East, we caught it in the grass and could keep it all in the grass. We don't have that with this one. It's, it's all still in the forest. Um, I wanted you to know that there's a bear team arriving Saturday. That stands for burned area emergency rehabilitation, known as BEAR. And the reason that we've called them in, and they're coming from the Black Hills in South Dakota, is because um, it's, a, it's a very intense burn. So if any of you have been down to the 201 East Fire, there's kind of strips of black trees, strips of green, black, green. It's what we call a mosaic. This fire is not a mosaic. It's mostly black. So when we're able to open the forest back up and you go see it, it, it looks very different. Um, the fire happens in the fall, so we're not having, there's not gonna be a lot of grass growing up underneath the thick stands of trees. So we hope probably grass will come back, but it needs, let's see, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm explaining this very well. It's, it's very barren. So if we get snow on it, we'll be in good shape, it'll hold. If we get rain, we could lose like the 203 road. There's some places where it's likely going to wash out. So that's the brand new road that we just fixed. Thank you, Mother Nature. Um, so the bear team, what they do is they come and say, well, what can we do to maybe help prevent the road from washing out? Can we get a native seed mix, put, you know, 
get some seeding down. Not that it would grow this year, but if we get snow on it, it would come back next summer. So that's what they're here for. Um, we've already started looking into um, salvage sales. So um, some people from Nebraska State Forest Service, Adams back there, his, his colleagues have asked about it. And that would be a good thing because what's going to happen right now is all those trees are going to start falling down and it's just going to be a mess. So the more of them that we can just get out would be better. So hopefully that will work. Um, I wanted to let you know that the area is going to be closed until we call it controlled. So we're still working on an official closure order. The 259, the Gaston Road will stay open. The Natick Campground will be open and Whitetail Campground will be open. If you, if you know anyone from Omaha that's planning on driving their rig down the 259 road, tell them they will lose their axles. <laughs> it's not, that's not, we're keeping those campgrounds open, but it's not going to be very easy to get to. So if, you know, we want hunters to still be able to have an opportunity, but the fire area needs to stay closed so that the firefighters can finish their work. Any snags that need to be cut down and fallen, if they can see something that's leaning, they're just gonna go ahead and take it out so that it doesn't fall and then our crew is stuck fixing it for the next five years. Um, Let's see here. I, um, you know, after the 1965 fire, we have a report where the Forest Service went through and asked the question, should we replant? And at that time, the answer was no. I won't give you the details, but it is there. Um, all I can say to you definitively is I, I will not plant eastern red cedar trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, it kind of started as an experimental forest, like will trees grow in the sand hills? Will it bring more moisture? Um, we might keep it in an experimental forest. Can we grow something different? I don't know. There's a lot of conversations that could be had. So uh, I don't have an answer to that today, but you can count on me, no Eastern Red Cedars. So I think in closing, I, I just want to say that I hope you got a sense of what Ted goes through when we get these fires and how fast things happen. He didn't talk much about the slurry drops in the plains. Um, I think you probably ordered those really quickly. He forgot that part. <laughs> yeah. And um, they're not close. Where'd they come from? Some of them were like Colorado. And by the time they get here, when you saw that smoke cloud that people could see from 40 miles away, you can't put a plane in front of that. So some of the question, we saw a comment about, well, why did you put slurry on the houses but not the 4-H camp? It's because the way the wind blew, the wind had blown over the houses, slurry drop would have gone on the 4-H camp. That's just the way it happened. And as Ted told you, we thought it was going to go straight north, and it just happened to go a little bit more west. So, um, so yeah, the, it's, there's just a lot that goes on, and none of us want to see this happen. It's very disruptive. I appreciate you all coming so much. I want to say that um, I am kind of a Nebraska transplant. I grew up in the big city, and I just, um, just feel so proud of the people here and all of their competence and hard work and generosity and how you take care of each other. It's really, really a rare thing in today's world. So um, I've just really loved all my time here and I'm sorry that I had to be here while this, I'm sorry that this happened. So with that, I think I don't have anything else to say and we'll do questions. All right, are there any questions? And if not, and you would prefer to just break to the maps and have conversations, we can do that as well. Yes, ma'am. I'd just like to have a round of applause for the audience, thanking them for having this meeting, and also all the hard work that all the firefighters, mm -hmm. every place, all the federal people, and everything. We need to tell you how much we appreciate you, how much Ted, we appreciate Ted calling people in from all over, Heather and beyond. Um, big deal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Yes. I know there's probably millions of venue for this, but uh, 
the Farm Service Agency and NRCS are here for the private landowners. If you have any questions on what you can, we can do to help you, uh, Megan is here and uh, Leah, who is the local NRCS, is here. I'm Chris. I'm an uh, acting district conservationist for here. I don't know if Anna, Donna, Bob is here. Oh, there you go. So the NRD is also here. I know that's not what this venue is, but we are here if you have questions about private land stuff. That's perfect. Thank you very much. And if you couldn't hear on on Facebook, it was just an announcement that there are resources here for the landowners uh, to start to get assistance. Any question. other? Yes. Were the ATVs on the trails? Yes. Yes. So, so when Tim actually went out there, the, the machine that started on fire was a, a Polaris RZR, and it was right in the middle of the trail. You could see where they tried to throw sand on it to put it out. The other two ATVs were, <clears throat> oh, I don't, 800 yards to the north, um, going with the fire when they um, just quit running. They probably just ran out of air or something. Mm. And like Julie said, I did forget about the airplanes. Those was ordered right when I was still in the lookout tower. I even actually asked for a VLAT. The closest one was in California, so I did not take that one. And the lookout tower did get hit with the retardant. It had two drops of retardant on the lookout tower. Um, I tried to put it on the 4-H camp first. They couldn't see the 4-H camp because of the smoke. The, so they put the two on the um, lookout tower, and th uh, those trees did not burn, but the lookout tower did. Um, and as it was talked about, uh, you know, a lot of questions about the cause. The um, If you did not see the statement that went out, the official statement from law enforcement doing the investigation, is that the preliminary investigation of the fire was has determined it was human caused due to a UTV fire on an, on the existing recreational trail system. It is still open, and so as time progresses, they will provide more information. They just have to get through that entire process um, before they can provide more details. So thank you for your patience in that as they go through all of that paperwork and process that they have to. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um what is the protocol on how dry it has to be before you shut the four wheeling down? Okay. So the question is, what is the protocol on how dry does it have to be before you shut the four wheelers down? And I'm, I'm looking to the expert to answer that. <laughs> so that, that goes through your fire restrictions. <clears throat> So once we usually get up into the 90th percentile, that's when we start putting in the stage one, stage two, stage three. Um, last week, um, even on the FMO call, we were not in the 90th percentile. Every time we get to the 90th percentile, we'd get a sprinkle, and it would bring our ERCs down. So. I wanted, can I add to that, too, yeah. Randy? That, that's a really good question. So. We have to have good reason to go into a closure, and part of our job as public land is to keep it open to the public. Um, the, the stage three is full forest closure, so normally the earlier stages just limit fires, open campfires, and the very first stage is you can't have an open campfire out in the back 40. You can still have them in the fight campfire rings. Um, and then I think we shut them down from the fire rings I, 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 we'd have to look at the details, but the other thing is that we, we can't just go in and out of fire restrictions like that because it confuses the public about what's open and what's closed, and, and it's, we have to post it, we have to block it. So when we go into fire restrictions, we expect to be in them for a certain period of time. It's not, it's not a simple process to go in and out, and it's not fair to the public to, to be changing the rules so quickly. So since I've been here, we've not had a need to fully close the forest except for after a fire. It's not never been dry enough to close the whole forest. Does that help? Was it just an exceptionally dry year? It was an exceptionally dry year, but Ted said the metrics that we use do not 
um, trigger it, yeah. You know, most of our fire starts are lightning. So um, as was the 2-0 and East fire, this is a pretty much of a one-off. We had the 600 acres with the hunters. So that's, that's another reason what, like, better than 90% of our fires are lightning. So closing the forest does nothing for that. So that's something that we've also historically looked at. I would say that going forward, we might take this and maybe look at live fuel moistures. And if those are super dry, we might change things. Um, there, there is no guarantees about fire, and fire is a natural part of both the prairie and the forest. Yes, ma'am. I realize that HEDs, you know, you're, you're trying to keep the, the forest open to the public. Would there be a possibility in the future that you could require HEDs to carry a fire extinguisher, make it a requirement? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, we could look into that, definitely. On the tip of my tongue, that you didn't hear it from me, is that the people, who, the, they acted very responsibly, these ATV riders. It was just a freak thing. Yeah. And for young kids, too. I like if... So uh, I went and I went and looked at it, and right, I mean, right from where it started, it's it goes right up into the top of the trees and it's gone. So I don't even know if it, it was even burning for that long before it left. So, <clears throat> and the only other reason why I don't think the fire extinguisher might not have worked, we had a. A pickup that caught on fire, and so the machines are fuel injected now. So once it started on fire, it just kept squirting, and I don't, I don't know for sure if stuff got shut off. I mean, <coughs> they, they got out right. So <coughs> what it's going to keep doing is just quit. And I think that's why when they were throwing the sand on it, it didn't help at all either. So that's why I think it, just the reaction it probably would not have helped. This, this reminds me that um, maybe one thing, this is maybe the last thing that you want to hear, but what, what, the, what we've been learning, so the Forest Service for 100 years has said, put out every fire by 10 a.m. the next day. As a result of that, you have trees that are planted four feet apart. When they get this dry, they're touching the running crown fire. What would actually help is to have more timber sales, thin out the trees, and fire stays on the ground. The other thing we don't want is we don't want the eastern red cedars to increase to the point where they become this dry. So you private landowners who aren't taking care of your eastern red cedar trees, the res that's what happens. That's what happens in a forest fire, right? We always think we're going to get it in the grass. So if you have a forest fire, it is so much harder to get a hold of. So I think that probably even even better like we're gonna have some fire but if we could have more forest management fewer eastern red cedar trees more regular burns ironically I think that having had these two fires might actually allow us to do more prescribed burns through the forest now that there's been a severe fire probably what's left would be easier to just burn through get rid of the needles thin out some trees that that's probably the best long term solution I mean, there's always going to be human components that need to be addressed, too. Thank you. Any other questions? How long did you say that uh, the hot shots would be out on private ground? Thank you. I can answer that. Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, how long will the hot shots be out on the private ground? So um, the fire resources are, like I said, our team is, is our last full day of work is tomorrow. We're keeping um, 
most of the the resources that are remaining behind, I want to say it's three or four engines and a few modules of firefighters, um, they're mostly going to be working on federal ground. The fire up on the private land north of Highway 2, um, it is as close that we can get it to fully, um, I don't want to use the word control, but it has really no chance to escape out of that. So there's not much more work to do up there, and uh, we don't want to pay people just to sit. So, but there is, you know, some more labor, some more work to do on the federal land, on the forest, chipping and, and, and picking up that. The stuff north of Highway 2 is mostly just the grass. So, um, yeah, this, this country up in here is mostly the private land. Obviously, this down here is the, uh, um, the federal land. And so most of the labor, I believe, is going to continue uh, efforts down there to, to work on that more. So long story short, I would bet you're probably not going to see a lot of firefighters up in this Division Lima area after uh, Saturday. You better talk to me. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Where it's red, that's where they're still hot. The black is out. Well, not out, but that's contained. We feel really good about So that's why we mark it black. The only concern that would be up here is in this red little spot. And once we get this turned over, I'll be having a conversation with Spencer. And if, he, if they just want to take it from there, they sure can. Or if they want us to send up resources, we will. But. We're, we're going to just have that conversation between the fire chiefs, and we'll go from there on that. And then <clears throat> on the forest side, of course, we're going to be checking the red spots, but hopefully by Saturday, these guys got it whipped on all of it, and we're just in patrol, but otherwise, we'll be doing the whole thing. And, and just knowing my folks, we'll hit the red, and then we'll check, double check everybody just because that's what they do. That ain't true. That answer your question? Yes, sorry. <laughs> I know, sorry about that. It, it's odd to hold a microphone when we're not actually uh, projecting to the room. It, we're doing it for the online. Um, we didn't talk about containment. So Julie mentioned the acreage, but we're at 94% contained, or we were as of last night. So we um, don't have an update on the progress that was made today. That number may go up a little bit uh, by the time we get back to our command post. Are there any other questions? I'm gonna give people time. Okay, with that, I would just like to thank you for coming this afternoon and spending your time with us. I hope you found the meeting helpful um, to get some of those questions answered. As I mentioned earlier, we do have maps around the room. Uh, we're happy to stay as long as you need. If you wanna have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, come find any of us. and. And we would be happy to do that. So thank you very much.